questions three and four. And now we're on the fifth question, yes. um, which is the question about harmonizing all the different things that Plato says about musique, right? Which is more broader than just music. It includes like poetry and dancing. It's uh, maybe something like culture, you know, like a, a musicos person is a is a cultured person. Okay. So, yeah. What was the start? So it's a page 56 in the 5620 in the Greek. Yeah, I have it. What was the question, if I remember? Um, he didn't say, right? He just said. Well, well, he, he, he repeats the question at the, at the beginning of this discussion. Okay. So, okay. enough of this, enough on these matters, okay, enough. Now, <laughs> uh, the matters of division of the art and things like that. Okay. Now we need to know like this, according to him, what must one know about music or musique and poetry? Musique. Okay. Musique, okay. Um, how come this is in second I don't know what this is. Okay. Yeah. Um, how are they related to one another? So music and poetry. How many categories of music are there? It would seem that at some point he attaches music to poetry. For instance, when he says, the poet sits on the tripod of the muse. So tripod being like the, uh, the thing that the... Uh, that, the that the oracle sits on. Yeah, okay, All right. Or when he says that the possession of the muses takes hold upon a gentle and innocent soul, rouses it to Bachic frenzy and inspires it to songs and other poetry. That's the Fidris. It's becoming crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one place. In another place, in other poems, it seems to have placed them apart from one another. As is the case when it distinguishes the kind of lives takes the musical way of life and puts it in the first rank as he does with all those who have lovers of beauty and puts the poetic way of life in the sixth rank. I don't remember the ranks as he does with all those who are imitative. Yeah, I mean, the details of the ranks themselves aren't important. Like the tyrant is one of the last uh, the life of the tyrant and also the life of the Priests are amongst the last ranks, and the and the seer. But at the top, there is you know the everyone who loves beautiful things and the philosopher. And but what's important here is that it's the same text, right? It's also in the Phaedrus, this um, um this ranks of life. So at one point he seems to say poetry is identical with musique because it's caused by possession by the muses, and then later he says, but the poet is um, is down there in the sixth rank. So much, much lower, like not much like lower. Being, yeah. Being yeah. By the muses is, is a good thing. Like in all these places. Right. It's not only that it's, uh, that it's much lower, but also that he puts, you know, he puts the musical way of life in the first and then the, um, and then poetry in the sixth. Mm -hmm. So they're definitely distinct things. All right. Yeah. Okay. Takes the musical, oh yeah, uh, thus having seen that there are many forms of musique, he seems to put the entire poetic genus under musique, mm -hmm. but all that is musical is not confined to poetry. So there's more kinds of musique than poetry. Right. That is for sure. And some of the poetry might be musique and some not. Is that what's the... No, he seems to be saying here that all all poetry is musique, but not all musique is poetry. And does that answer the problem? No, not yet. Okay. Not yet. 
it is worthwhile therefore for us to say what music we would call poetic and once we have defined all the forms of music yeah so he's going to now go through and organize what Plato says about music here okay different dialogue. so therefore we say that philosophy itself is the greatest the greatest music eh? as the features just as it is the most erotic if you are willing to say that what is most erotic is that which has harmonized not the lyre but the soul itself in the best harmony A harmony through which it is able both to introduce order to all things human and to celebrate the divine matters perfectly imitating the leader of the muses himself on the one hand celebrates the father with intellectual songs and then the other establishes continuity throughout the whole cosmos by means of insoluble bonds, moving all things together, as Socrates, in fact, says in the Cratylus. This is Apollo. Um, and um, and the Cratylus thing is, 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 an, is an etymology of Apollo from uh, peripolane to cause to circle. And so... Yeah, that's uh, he, he, he's he means Apollo here, okay. And that is the philosophy, yeah, right. Because Apollo also is like patron of philosophy, the um, the, the god that speaks to Socrates, right? And those things, so so and philosophy is the and this is the greatest music because it is the greatest harmony. Right, because the truest harmony is the harmony of the soul itself. Right. Just like Apollo is the harmony of everything. Right, so the the soul, when it is in the best harmony, it can order things and it can and and it can also um, worship the gods properly. It can do these two things. And Apollo does the two things. He, he celebrates the father with intellectual songs, and he also establishes order in the um, in the universe. Okay, and, and what is the and what is the what is the uh, celebrating the father thing? Like, uh, what is the celebrating the father thing? You mean what what would this be? So the father is um, probably here. Zeus, the demiurge, and the the intellectual songs here are probably then um, cognitions of the forms of the demiurge by the planetary and world souls. And so... And, and that is also a part of music that is sort of like the... Well, I mean, it's part of it's it's part of music to you know the song and dance and poetry are part of part of music, and so also uh, you know songs worshiping the gods like the Homeric hymns. That's music as well that falls fall, falls in that, and they um, and this is then part of the. You know the platonic contention that actually the best way to really if you really want to please the gods you don't do that with words or you don't do that with um with perceptible things you do that with the intellectual activity of, of knowing them and then becoming like them you know becoming virtuous because um, you exercise news mm -hmm. okay so it is for this reason that we would say that inspired music belongs in the primary sense Meaning, like the most real um, artist or musique is the philosopher. Though the fact that the philosopher is divinely inspired is something that escapes most people. Okay, interesting. In the in the in, in the Phaedo, the Phaedo is uh, there's the passage where um, Plato says that the philosopher is a Bacchus, right? So that's how he compares him to someone. Uh, possessed by Dionysus. Right, and most people think that he's just thinking. Yeah. And yeah. Okay, and 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 when even so so in other words since 
is the definition of music being like uh, inspired by the muses is that's what it means yeah that's like the whatever right the muse i mean inspire is music right almost like etymologically right so this is it's kind of yeah it's like ye. um this is kind of a uh you know twisting the term say oh you you call this music well you know philosophy is the most inspired thing by the muses so it's the true music you know Right. And there's two things. There's also because philosophy is supposed to produce harmony. So it's like all of Socrates' stuff work like this, right? Exactly. You really you think you're hungry, but you really want to be a philosopher because hungry means something, which turns out to mean that. <laughs> exactly. If you're not a philosopher, how will you know what you really want? And how do you know if what you really want is to eat? Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, so and to, and to an even greater extent, the goods of educative music are his, and he has in a simple manner all the things we look to. What is a simple manner? All the things we look to when we see we deem music to be a serious matter for anyone. Right, a simple manner here. Haplos means um, he has the basic form of these things. So, like he has harmony. itself right the 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 basic form of harmony is harmony of your soul and then the other forms are harmony are qualified forms so it's like harmony of strings of a lyre harmony of sound harmony of this or that mm -hmm. okay this of course is the most right. advanced and, and also by saying that it's the primary sense And also by saying that this is the primary sense of musique, he's saying that this is the original sense that the others are somehow copies or der or, or der derivative versions. Mm -hmm. Right. So this, of course, is the most advanced form of musician. As we have said, is identical with one who is truly a philosopher, someone for whom none of the goods of musique are lacking. So the true musician or music a person is the philosopher although yeah. he doesn't know how to make any music because right, it's there's... only the primary thing yeah yeah he doesn't know how, know how to make any music and let's say the yeah the the art um the art sense and um so this is this is like Also, the you know the philosopher is also the primary politician, the primary statesman because he knows what the ideal city is like, but he might not know how to actually deal with an office full of people and get them to do what they have to do. You know? yeah. Right. So it's not clear that's very useful. That's a different problem. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So th that's that's like one kind of music, eh? which is inspired right. and celeb like this whole thing. It's inspired, and what's harmonized is the soul. Mm -hmm. Does does inspired like mean that the philosopher, when he is doing his like form getting, which is thinking, uh. Is like really, um, how do you say? I don't know like what the difference between inspired and uninspired means. Like, does that give him a, does like, because the whole thing of philosophy is that your authority is not, I was inspired. Like even Socrates goes right. around saying, I have the human, I can prove that the God was right, but that I'm the smartest person, all kinds of things like that. I'm not going to say this is true because I said that. No, precisely. So, yeah, and this is also for Proclus what's um, characteristic of Plato's theology, right? So, like, you can get true theology from Homer or Orpheus or, or Pythagoras and so on, but what's uh, characteristic of Plato's theology is that he presented it in dialectical terms. So he, he gives you the arguments, right? And that's, like, um, that's what's uh, crucial about it. Um, so, no, I don't think that whenever the philosopher's, you know, thinking he's... immediately inspired 
and that's not also the claim um that that's not also why you know why you should believe him um but what i think that the what proclus wants to say by saying that it is inspired is to say that it is some way of being in touch with the gods and um and knowing them um so it's and it's um Yeah, um, he also thinks, yeah, he and Iamblichus and so on think that philosophy is a necessary condition for you to be a, you know, like a, a good priest, a good, uh, a good theurgist, someone who does ritual, um, ritual to be an instrument of the gods, because the gods won't act through you if you're not a fitting receptacle and you're not a fitting receptacle if you're not virtuous. And you're not virtuous if you don't have philosophy because you don't know yourself and so on. Um, so the I think the um, you know the philosopher is someone who can occasionally be in that state of inspiration where he's just an instrument of the gods. Yeah. Right, but the so so the question is 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 philosophy. Is the philosophy really an instrument of the gods, just in this like complicated way where it does dialectic? Or is that like the whole theurgy thing is to say that it's not really enough to be a philosopher, right? Right. But on the other hand, there's something like there's the idea that philosophy is somehow a gift of the gods. So even if like you're not um, you know, you're not fully uh, saying I am Apollo while you're teaching. What you're giving on and what you're sharing is something that ultimately comes from the gods that was given mm -hmm. by them. So that's how he describes Plato's philosophy at the beginning of the Platonic theology. I see. And is that why most people don't realize that the philosopher is divinely inspired? Um, I'm not sure why most people don't realize that the philosopher is divinely inspired. Um. I mean, yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, that might be a reason. Proclus doesn't explain it here. In general, he thinks, you know, his opinion of the most people is very bad. And he says, well, they think that we're just, you know, babbling about and not doing anything serious because they have no conception of the forms and so they think that you know this is all empty talk and um so that probably goes goes together that they don't see that the philosophy is divinely inspired because they don't recognize that the that that abstractions can be real like the abstract thought can be talking about real things and by you know and real things that are like the structures of reality through which the gods act mm -hmm. yeah. right so god so like something like i'm sorry if i'm off topic mm -hmm. so god means some divinely inspired that least corresponds in the minds of most people to something like real like if someone builds a big building, he must be divinely inspired because I could see the building. It seems very real. And but if someone just gives a speech, it doesn't seem like he's doing anything. Uh, well, I, I think it's not just that it's a speech. It's that you know, the philosophical speech. You know, they they just can't follow it. He's like, oh, they go to, to hear Plato, and Plato's talking about the one and the good and number, and they don't see heads or tails. They they think this is just you know, abstract uh, thought that doesn't refer to anything. But if they go to hear someone, um, you know, uh, reading Homer or, or or something, they think, oh, no, this this guy, you know, could be divinely inspired and so on because that's things they can grasp, right? Okay, something like where people always think that Socrates denies the gods because they seem... Well, whatever exactly that's supposed to mean. Um, but he's like, well, I believe in the forms and who are better than your gods in some way. And the reason you think I'm an atheist is because you think that gods don't exist or the kind of gods I believe in. 
Right, something like the the philosopher is actually trying to, you know, in some sense, internalize, have a more internal um, access to the gods, right, through arguments that the soul knows and has a grasp on these things and doesn't depend just on the say-so, the authority of someone else. And, but people don't, don't recognize that as ha actually giving some act some special access yeah because they only well they they only believe in things they can that have bodies and shapes that's basically the idea um is this hmm so like, so like this is um this is con connected to the idea that Oh, you know, I think the the philosopher he comes and he gives these allegorical explanations of the myths. It's because he doesn't really believe. He is just explaining away these things and putting them in his system. And to which um, Proclus says, "No, no, no. This is actually how you get to the real content of the myths. And what you believe in by taking these myths literally is, um, you know, hardly exists compared to the things that I." I'm in touch with. Right. So I still wonder about the author, like if the philosophers would have given up on this something of a pretense of not speaking with authority, um, which is really a very difficult thing to tease out, like the whole enlightenment uh, game was saying like what happens when you really disbelieve authority seems mm -hmm. to like raise a lot of questions about that. Right. Um, and like, and then they say, like, it's already an ancient criticism that philosophy has schools, and that doesn't seem like people that hold no authority. Um, if they would have not done that, would that sound more divine? Like, you if mean... there would be the cult of Plato, or which people would say that's what philosophy is, the cult of Plato, which believes everything the divine Plato says because he said so, or because he was divinely inspired, right? Uh, right. as some kind of revelation of the truth. And forget about all the arguments and things like that. Well, well what would happen? I don't know. I think, I think on one hand, it would be easier for people to, to understand it as something divinely inspired, but... Um, Maybe they'd believe that for the wrong reasons, right? Um, if we're thinking from Proclus' perspective, um, because I mean, in a sense, you know, this cult of Plato and the divine Plato, you could say, well, that's what the Neoplatonic school became, right? That's what the Platonists became, and um, yeah, I wonder if uh, also. If he has in mind here a Christian context, right? Christian cultural context, right? Where, and then in that case, there's this idea that, you know, like that philosophy needed Christianity to be to be fulfilled, and that Plato just had some seeds of truth. When there's a positive appreciation, there's also the other view that oh, that's all demons talk. Um, but the when there's a positive appreciation, there's this idea that oh, you needed something else, and you needed, well, Christianity. And then there the thing is, well, the Platonists aren't going around healing anyone, and they're not going around exercising anyone, and so we need, you know, um, uh, you need this kind of thing. Um, or, oh yeah, even if you don't have the... Even if you don't have the the miracles... There's something like it doesn't. I'm trying to think like because Augustine, for instance, is, is someone who is a Christian, who's a, a Platonist who became a Christian, and who. But you know the miracle, that fact that miracles are happening isn't central for him because he thinks like it's been a, that there are hardly any miracles in his day, and um. But for him, he has this thing that he didn't find in the Platonists that the God became flesh, right? He, he learned in the Platonists that God had a son, but not that he became flesh. 
and and so there there's like the lack of some kind of promise of universal salvation right some something that can that's not just for the intellectuals that's for everyone um and i guess the implicit thing is you know the god reaches to everyone it doesn't just reach to, to the intellect so if it's divine it should reach to everyone and it should just spread the truth for everyone and give everyone a chance of salvation this is actually something that Proclus sometimes uses against for instance uh uh, imagined Aristotelian opponents where he says the gods are beyond noose and that's why they their activity goes beyond noose right that's why uh, um if if the if noose was the first then the best thing would just be would just be being intellectual but there's more than that to the world um so that might be a something that's you know, that's like a criteria of divine inspiration that people might normally find lacking in um, in philosophy. And part of what the Neoplatonists did or was to say, no, look, philosophy is actually just one element in this bigger divine project. And so it's of a piece. It's of one. It's just one fabric, philosophy and the myths, right? And you get the myths, the myths and the rituals, they, they're accessible to everyone, but then philosophy will let you penetrate to the center of this. Um, and but it's also, you know, it's also a divine instrument. Um so that's yeah, that and that would then all and then that also explains like, oh, okay, so the philosophy you go to the philosophers specifically and they're not raising anyone from the dead but then again you're not they're not supposed to look at them as something isolated you have to look at them as part of this whole pagan culture so right what i was thinking about this like this is something i mean the uh the kuzari is very uh, i think it's much earlier than him but like he has this like whole thing philosophers have nice ideas but they don't do anything and it's weird like he's even like the philosophical religious people have this idea of philosophy preparing you to meet god which isn't borne out by reality because no philosophers become prophets um and then like it seems like you could say two things Right, you could just deny the facts that he's saying. Like maybe the philosophers you know aren't prophets, but that's just because they're not good philosophers. The real philosophers actually are prophets. Uh, they do make miracles. Uh, you know, uh, you know, all these lives of the Neoplatonic saints have miracles and weird stuff. Um, yeah, and it's anyways like, like it's very weird. Like yeah, and, and the. Yeah, like tradition has miracles that just keep just keep taking them on faith, and you just don't not supposed to believe philosophers. That's the whole problem with them. Um, so that's one thing you could say, or you could say something more like, uh, "Well, miracles are things that happen in bodies, and you're thinking of some very low things when you're asking for miracles, and the fact that you're asking for that, or like what you call prophecy, which is really just." images or imagination things like that well you can do that but that like that would be like too low of a thing for a philosopher to do um or you yeah. could say a third thing which is what you're saying which is something like well maybe there's like a yeah and maybe philosophy is not like again the kusura has this thing where like parodies almost the philosopher is saying like well yeah we need religion for for the masses for the culture so whatever anyone would work and the same way as any other one, more or less, just make one up. Doesn't make a big difference what you believe or what you tell the people and what they do, as long as they do something. And and that's again seems to him like just very implausible as a because he has this whole thing that God must have specific things which he wants and doesn't want, like the dream and stuff. Um, and then you could say something like. Mm -hmm. That this is wrong because it's true that philosophy on its own, as in like the things that are in Aristotle's books, 
are not supposed to create a world. Like you can't actually create a world or a culture just based on that. And it was not based on, was never worked that way. It's always going to work as like being some kind of priesthood of a, of a existing culture, which the gods or whoever who is beyond philosophy really is just like the philosopher's philosopher of the Republic, which is like giving everyone a job and philosophers have a job too, which is the best right. job, of course, but only, <laughs> but in an incomplete way, because like they have to think simply and in order to do it, you have to articulate them and you have to like go down the the process of emanation until you end up with non-philosophy. And, and in other words, like, yes, the philosophers don't make miracles, but that's not to say that we disbelieve the, like, I don't know, the shrines and the whatever other kind of people that do make miracles. It's just not my job. Yeah, exactly. It's part of a bigger whole. And um, of course, this is not the miracle working or the, you know, or, or the prophecy producing role, but it's part of the bigger, but those exist in the same whole and you can't have everyone do everything. Right. Um, and yeah, so, and, and that's also compatible with the, um, with the other two, with two of the other answers that you gave, right. It's also compatible with the, no, but actually some philosophers, we do have stories that they do both. And it's also compatible with thing like these are different realms of being, and this this is not the the um, producing images and corporeal effects is not what we philosophers are dedicated to doing, right? And so it's compatible with those other two. It's not compatible with the oh, religion is just this thing for the masses, right? Thing. Um, and you know, just invent one, and then people will be happy. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that's about, you know, I think you've got a good grasp on prophet's position and then that's, and then you ask, well, but yeah, but, and to go back to your question, well, why do most people not recognize philosophy of, of, as divinely inspired? It's well, because they don't see the connection between what philosophy does and all these other activities. Yeah. And right. Yeah. Yeah. And we can also say that then they do they don't know the cases of individual philosophers that do both. And um and they also don't um don't appreciate the different ontological levels that are being worked on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, that's uh that's a good a good digression. Good digression. Okay. Yeah, you made a parenthesis that most people. Okay. Um. Okay, and then even so, let's let's continue then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. And to an even greater extent. Um. No. And where okay. am I? He says uh, that. So. Um. I'm trying to read back back to the. He says that I mean, possession by the muses. Yeah. One second. Yeah. Um, oh, the fact that I am um, the name, so get oh, yeah, yeah, I'm in the next paragraph. Okay, he says, so that's so there's one thing that philosophy is is, is the greatest thing. Okay, now he says that possession by the muses is a musique in another sense, and as much as it stimulates and moves the soul to inspired poetry. In relation to which he would say that whoever arrives at the gates of poetry without the madness of the muses is one who is an imper imperfect poet. And that his poetry, that of the man in his senses, will be eclipsed by that of those who are mad. Right. That's the feature saying that normal people don't make good poetry. Right. In this case, that which is musical and that which is poetic come to the same thing with inspired music perfecting the inspired poet. So again, musique in the in the sense of whatever is like dr driven mad by the muses is so musique in the sense of inspiration of the muses is what makes the best poet, right? 
And so, and this is the second sense of musique, and in this sense of musique, it's identical with poetry. It also includes poetry, or it only includes yeah. poetry. Seems to be it only includes poetry, from what he says. I mean, you can continue okay. reading. In this case, that which is musical and that which is a poetic come to the same thing with inspired music. Okay, perfecting the inspired poet. After all, it does not say that possession by the muses inspires a person to anything other than becoming a poet. On the one hand, celebrating the great deeds of those who have gone before in hymns, and on the other, rousing those who have come after to the pursuit of education through them. So the, the muses who make people crazy never make them do anything besides for poetry. At this point, I mean, I can think of many ways of being crazy, but that wouldn't be. At this well, point, remember, this is a, in the Phaedrus, he distinguishes four different kinds of madness. And madness by the muses is only one of them. Um, there's also, I mean, the main kind of madness that he's discussing is by Eros, right? Making people in love. But he also discusses the um, mantic madness caused by Apollo, so which produces oracles and seers. And by Dionysus, which produces purification. Okay. So, and, and those don't make poetry. Like, if you're those gonna... don't make poets, but inspiration by the muses makes poets. Mm -hmm. Okay. At this point, he has shown what the function of poetry is, and to extend to which it pertains to education, meaning that it's going to make the poet celebrate the great things that people have done, and therefore, you'll want to imitate them as well as showing that it is not the same as the function of the lawgiver, but that instead is genuinely three removes from the truth, since it educates those who are keen on the pursuits that aim at good things through encomia of those who previously aimed at good things. Again? Right, encomia, um, uh, complementary discourses, right? So that say good things about these people. And he says it's three degrees from the truth because I guess it's there's the what's what's good in itself, then there are the people who previously did what's good, and then there's the image. Uh, in the third place, there's the image in the poetry. Right? Hmm. So there's, I don't know, there's cunning, and then there's the cunning hero, right? Odysseus, and then there's the Odysseus in... Um, in the Odyssey, right? Right, and, and this is like some kind of version of like the Republic Book 10's arguments about poetry being three. Right, yeah. Um, And that's why, so this is, it's still divine inspired, but it's, okay. Right, and 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 this is different from the lawgiver, right? Because the lawgiver he creates a law that says it's good to do X, so he's as it were on the second level, right? Okay. Whereas the since the poet he refers to a an example, then he's on the third level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's remind me of something. I forget what. Okay. So this mode of education was especially familiar to the ancients through a certain kind of experience of those who have lived virtuously, leading others to virtue on the basis of imitating them. For instance, the person who, according to the poet, says the following makes this clear. So, so too we have heard the fame of men of old. And do you not see the fame that goodly rest is one among all mankind? or such warriors I have never seen since, nor shall I see, mightiest were these. So what he's showing from all these quotes is something like that the ancients cared very much about this like fame that the heroes had. Yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, that Homer in his poetry shows that the, you know, shows people imitating prior models, right? And oh, he's okay. also, and he's ex explaining what he like what he is doing by doing that as well, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so we see that that is what it's for. So we even like have this. We we so it turns out we even have something like uh, third, fourth removed from the truth. If you're imitating someone who was imitating someone who was inspired by an image of someone who did a good thing, who is an image of the good. Right. <laughs> um, this is I think this is part of, and you know, there's there's a you can pick way, but then. The more you get further away, the worse the copy is going to be, especially if we're talking about imitation and time. So there's, you know, memory can be failing. And so you get worse and worse. But that's precisely why it's important that the poet is inspired by the muses, right? The muses are the daughters of memory and of mnemosyne. And also, whenever the poet is going to do something that's a big feat of memory, for instance, before the list of ships, I think, he um, he goes and he does another call to the muses after like the begin the one at the beginning of the poem, and um, or like when he Hesiod right he's going to tell about the origin of the gods something that he couldn't possibly be be there for, and so he also in invokes the muses, and um, so and this is like part of the Platonic argument against Aristotle. Because, of course, Aristotle says, well, you know, you don't need transcendent forms, just one one generation per, um, passes a form to the next. But then the point of the um, uh, of Platonists, no, you need this uh, transcendent form. And sometimes, you know, concretely in, uh, incarnated in a, in a daimon or a god or something, because that's what maintains the quality of the generations of the copying. Right. Mm -hmm. right this is like uh people like saying it's the best way to teach is by example and that it might be true like the gods have done this by inspiring uh the poets but that is true because it's a very low way of teaching maybe people need that but it would be better to be the example or even better to just be the good right But like teaching by this course, like explaining what the good is, is only good in insofar as it actually teaches you that, which might be maybe the problem of most word teaching is that it doesn't even do that. It's right. Like Patience, yeah. it's saying, do this, okay. Yeah, and there's not um, the teaching by example doesn't, um, I mean, yeah, the I mean, the abstract teaching of what is good um, has the problems that you have to know how to adapt it to the particular situations, whereas when you see by example, you already see it adapted to a particular situation mm. and um, and things like that. Yeah. So it's actually, and also, you know, you is, uh, it goes back to the things that we were talking about a moment ago that the abstract ethical teaching works for some people, works for some more intellectual people, but for most people, it's it's useless. Mm -hmm. Okay. So each of these teaches, but it teaches by example. The lawgiver, however, does not teach in this manner, but rather he says who the genuinely good person is and how the student might come to be like this. So the lawgiver doesn't say, doesn't tell you a story, he just says it's good to do something like this and also tells you how to do it meaning like i don't know something well, like if I you... guess it's uh so um i don't know you take the uh, um the phaedo right and he explains that it's uh good to um to live without the body because then you think better and the body keeps you from thinking and he teaches you what you need to do. You need to despise the pleasures of the body and you need to, mm -hmm. you know, um, do this and that. And like that. Okay. So education works by so, means yeah, I think the the paradigms, not particular ones. Okay. Yeah. Okay, he says, so that's the second kind of music, 
first one being philosophy, the second one being uh, poetry. Right. And then there's a third form of musique, which, unlike the previous one, is no longer inspired. Nonetheless, so philosophy is inspired and poetry is inspired, but there's a third one who's not even inspired. Nevertheless, it leads upward from perceptible harmonies to the imperceptible beauty of divine harmonies. Four. Such a musician, too, is a lover of beauty, just as the person who is erratic. Even if one is reminded of beauty through sight, while the musician is reminded of beauty through hearing. In yeah. any event... The translator has started using... The, the translator has started using the word musician because he's talking about music as we understand it now. Okay, so this is like someone who plays instruments or makes songs, things like that. Although, so not the per the poet who like says words and stories, but the right. person who just plays an instrument, he is still uh, drawn towards beauty, and the same in a similar way to someone who is erotic. Just that one is about sight, and this one is about hearing. Right. On any event. Like hear a beautiful song, see a beautiful thing or a beautiful person. In any event, he counted this person in the first incarnation along with the erotic person. In somewhere. That's the um the hierarchy of nine lives in the Petrus. Okay. Um he made those who have chosen the life that is upward leading and concerned with reversion from the things that are last. To those that are first, so that's the reverse, and from whence the soul has ascended here, three in number. The philosopher, the erotic person, and the musician. So there's three people who whose life is leading them upwards. Mm -hmm. Um, the latter's activities concern the beauty that is in harmonies and rhythms. That's the musician. From there, from these he, he ascends to the imperceptible harmonies and the rhythms that are never known through hearing, but are instead apparent to the reasoning of discursive thought. So the erotic person is the same as the musician here. Uh, no, the, the, the erotic person is through um, a sense perception or sight in general, whereas the, the musician is just about sound, so harmonies and rhythms. And so he goes from, as he says, the, he, the harmonies and rhythms that are perceptible, he goes to those that are known through the reasoning of discursive thought, so he can recognize the the scales and the tunes and the harmonies, mm -hmm. the mathematical harmonies. Right. So, so it's better to be a musician than to be erotic. In some, I way. think it's better to be erotic than to be a musician. Be I think the, the hierarchy is philosopher than, than erotic than um, than musician. I think it's better than to be erotic because there you see beauty in everything. Like everything can lead you up, whereas musician, it's just sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. From these he ascends to the imperceptible harmonies and to rhythms that are never known through hearing, but are instead apparent to the, so that's the philosophy level already. The erratic person's activities concerns that, yeah. all, all that is beautiful in sense perception, since he is such as to be reminded of beauty simpliciter and not the beauty of any particular thing. Again, that's like the that's where it should be, right? So a erratic person, someone who looking uh, is looking for beauty all over, and then Socrates calls, tells them, "Well, you're really looking for for philosophy because that's beauty itself." Right. Um, yeah, and, and that's so, really yeah. the philosopher. Right, and and that's the next thing, the philosopher. The philosopher goes from all sensible forms to the visions of the intelligible things of which the sensibles are images. Since he has undergone preparation and grasped the goal of both the musician and the erotic person in advance. Right. After all, let me should I, should I finish this? Um, after all, the a particular beautiful thing is doubtlessly beautiful, I suppose. And some particular form is doubtlessly a form. I'm not sure I can figure out what's going on. So he's he's explaining that he's going from more you know, from the more particular to the more uh universal so the musician 
he ascends by using a particular beautiful thing, beautiful music. And, and then, but the erotic person already uses any beautiful thing. And the, but he only uses beautiful things. The philosopher ascends um, not with any, with just beautiful things, but with any perceptible form, right? So, you know, even if, uh, I don't know, the, um, you know, concept of equality or of likeness doesn't need to be beautiful for it to be a starting point for the philosopher, for it to ascend. And, and so each one goes higher than the last. Uh, um, each one, I think it's true that each one goes higher than the last, but what he's saying now is just that each one has a, um, has more starting points than the last, right? Mm -hmm. um, the musician has only sound, the beautiful sounds. The erotic person has beautiful things in general. The philosopher has things, right? Anything with a form. Mm -hmm. And you would say something like, uh, you, like you go to a musician, like this would be like the kind of Socratic argument that we're doing. Like you go to a musician and you say, well, if you think about it, well, don't, if you think you're already not a musician, but anyways, but if you think about it, what you enjoy in playing music or in hearing music, really, is that there's some kind of uh, harmony, right? Or like someone would say, there's a pattern, you're recognizing some pattern, it makes sense. Like music, is it pleasurable? Because it makes sense in some way. And then I tell you, well, but sadly you're very limited because you're only enjoying life while you listen to music. How about you become a erotic person who sees like pleasure in the like symmetry of the grass or whatever and then you won't even have to play music to cite patterns in the world and then you say well that's good but now why don't you become a philosopher who is going to contemplate contemplate like the sameness and difference of blades of grass from each other and now you can do it with I don't know with anything and yeah yeah and like and then you like um, take a random leaf from a flower or from a tree and like this is completely ordinary, but you know, even here there's order. There's actually order even in the things that aren't beautiful. And so uh, anything. Um yeah, I mean, I don't know if like I don't know what the drive of this argument is. I don't know if it's just if if it's as you put it, just uh, oh, you know, you could have a more pleasurable life or something. But um it's because I think there's this, I mean, this would obviously come up against the difficulty of, you know, well, I, I just like music <laughs> and like, I'm not going to, right. I'm not going to become a, a painter or, or something else. Um, and, but this, I mean, I think there would, there would only be an occasion for argument if there was someone who was trying to argue something like all you need is music. Right, I'm a musician. You just you, you just need to learn with me, and then you, I mean, you will lead a good life, right? And then and then there there can be an argument against this person, right? So. All right, no, like what the thing with all these arguments, or I don't know if this is an argument because he's really like, thinking top down here. He's not like trying to get you from one to the other, but. What all these things are is like different, uh, like different things that would be really valuable about the philosophy or about the one thing, like, which end up being the same thing, but like something like, forget about like argument, but if someone says like, I don't even know what philosophy is trying to do, like, what is it for? Or what is it? And you say, well, it's basically the same thing that music is trying to do just in a different way. You might not convince the person that's happy with music, but you can at least make philosophy intelligible to him. We say like, well, you're interested in patterns. Well, I'm interested in even bigger patterns. 
Right. Yeah, that's actually like this is this is the opening of Aristotle's metaphysics, right? Everyone desires to know, and a sign of this is the flesh they have uh, from the senses. And then he goes saying, well, what, what are the kinds of knowledge? And actually the best knowledge is, uh, is this one about causes and about divine things, and that's what philosophy is. And so, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's, an argue, it's a similar argument to that, yeah, making philosophy intelligible to someone else. Okay. Right, but if, like you said, if it's supposed to really show something, it needs to be like a presupposition that already says that we're looking for like the most harmo harmonious life or the greatest God or something like that. If someone's not looking right. for that, then... Right, right. If, if it's supposed to do something more than just make it intelligible, if it's supposed to convince people to do philosophy, then there's yeah. Yeah, there's an additional thing. Right, and then and then it makes like sense. Like if we're like having like some like in like a, some kind of tiny, uh, spiritual world or something, where like everyone agrees that we're searching for a way to the whole or to God or whatever, and then you could say, well, your way of just playing music can't be the full way because it's partial. Right, right, and that might be that might be like a way to, yeah, like. Maybe if you're arguing with someone who says, you know, like, I at least, you know, make the make make the celebration sound good and, and 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 enjoyable. You just produce these words that don't mean anything, and then you explain, no, no, I'm actually doing what you do in a better way. Because when people understand what they're saying, what they're believing, and what they're imagining, then the, you know, it's a it's a greater harmony than this than the perceptible harmony that you produce. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the th third kind of music, or mm -hmm. music A, which is music. It's not inspired. I don't know why it's not inspired. Like, how? Why wouldn't it be inspired? I don't know. That is a quite, quite a good question. Why? Why wouldn't? I think it's just a textual. It's just a, from the textual basis. So, in this in this passage is not calling it inspired mm -hmm. That's it. but is there like uh, like the poet calls the muses is there like a so the musicians call on muses is that like yeah like help, me, I... help me play this song well today or something like that yeah i don't know i also don't know to what degree for instance the poetry that's got come to us wouldn't have had a musical accompaniment. I'm not sure about those details. So, yeah, I'm. I mean, of course, it's it's completely plausible, but there could also be. Um, it's just, you know, uh, poetry has been transmitted. The music has gone. Mm -hmm. Mostly, I mean, I know there are attempts to reconstruct ancient music and so on, but it's 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 not the same as we actually have manuscripts with somewhere on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it should be impossible for like the muse to tell you a song, just like they can tell you a poem. It's not. No, and yeah, and I mean the... So I'm thinking about Hesiod, and Hesiod, it seems it seems to be... He's, it's a, he's singing, right? The question is, why wouldn't... Why couldn't it be like playing an instrument, why couldn't that be inspired? Mm, I mean, someone might say the instrument is something artificial, but that, that's, that should be impediment. There are also stories of you know people using instruments to enchant people. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's in principle plausible. It's just Mm. And I don't think why well, I don't see why Proclus would have a problem with that. It must just be the the source text he's working with. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Now, continue. Now he also says that there is another kind of music. Okay, so we're up to a fourth kind. Uh, mm -hmm. In addition to these, that educates students' moral characters through both harmonies and rhythms that lead to virtue. 
It discovers which harmonies and rhythms are able to educate the passions of souls and to shape them with the best character traits in every action and situation. This is going back to like the thing where we have to find the right rhythms and things like that. Exactly. It also discovers those harmonies and rhythms which are opposite to these produce discord, discord in the souls, tensioning or slackening them and leading into this harmony and absence of rhythms. One might say that this is an educative music that is subordinate to politics and coordinate with gymnastics. There's this kind of music that Socrates looks to in the Republic when it introduces guidelines concerning musical modes and rhythms. Conversely, at this point, at the point at which he is searching for the sciences that have some sort of attraction towards the truth, he looks to the music which is prior to this, and he does not see fit to embrace this sensible harmony, but rather that which leads up towards universal principles, moving our intellect into intelligibles away from the sensible. Right. So this is this at the end he's talking about the music that comes up in book seven. Right. In book seven, he's talking about the mathematical arts, um, the mathematical sciences that the guardians have to learn in their curriculum. And for each one of them, he always says it's not about the concrete thing, right? So geometry is not by is not about measuring the land. It's about the um, the circle and the triangle. Astronomy is not about um, the these heavens. It's about general principles of motion. And he also says the same thing about music. It's not about these uh, these particular um, uh, instruments. It's about relations in general, proportions, right? And and so, and and that's also, I think, the the third. I think that that would be also identical with the third musica that we just saw. Okay, and the fourth one is what? And or is there a? The fourth one is different than the third because it's not about using music and like appreciating the harmonies. It's just about the moral function of uh, the educational function of the thing, right? So the third one is. You know, like the um, it's like appreciating Bach and appreciating all these elegant mathematical structures in Bach, and like oh that that's doing that while well, that's doing that they're going up and down uh, and, and around different ways, and um, whereas the the fourth one is you know just concerned and this is a parade we need to get people excited about the parade right so or this is this is a party and people need to dance so you need to have a good beat. And so it's no longer about taking people up to a perception of non-perceptible things, um, a, an understanding of non-perceptible things, but rather it's just about getting them to act in a certain way. And so it remains on the perceptible level. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it's some kind of gymnastic, like music as like what they put on in the gym to get people to move or something like that. So it's really just instructions to move or, or some kind of like education of the body or of the passions. Right. I mean, here, yeah, here the gymnastics is, you know, the uh, education of the body and mu music appears as education of the soul or the passions in, in, in the Republic. And, and precisely it's education of the passions for certain activities, right? To make people to good citizens that behave well, but not necessarily to people who know the forms. Okay, so like, uh, right, like you say, like we have, mm -hmm. okay. And here there were good ones and bad ones. Somehow there's rhythms that make you worse and so on. Right, yeah, yeah. Alan Bloom about metal and rap things. right something yeah. but the point is that it's like music that is it's function like you say something like the uh right we had the the word sort of which is the poetry and then we then we had like the harmonies or like the relations between the parts of the music and the things like that and now we have just the like noise of it or just like the beat, something like we would call the beat. I don't know if a beat is the same as the rhythm that he talks about. Right. I think it could be. 
Um, but yeah, there there is in some sense in this scale of one, two, three, four, there's um, the intellectual content goes down, right? So you start with philosophy, and then you get to poetry. You still have the the words, and then you get to the third thing. You don't have the words, just have the abstract relations. And now in the fourth, you don't even have the abstract relations. You just have, as it were, the the impact it has on the body, right? And yeah, and on on, on your mood and on things like that. Right? right, like whatever the subwoofer is supposed to be doing in those music, right? <laughs> Or like when you go to this coffee shop and they have like music that's like optimized for not saying anything, but somehow creating some kind of environment. Right, right. I mean, and, and that's all that's supposed to do, right? Like these, or these pop songs that when you, like they're there for people to dance to and so on, for, have a good time. But then if you actually look at the lyrics, they're super depressive. They're super depressing and things like right. that. Okay. And that is also important. Like again, it's go we need to know that if we were for the complete state or whatever, because that's part of education and you're gonna need to like sometimes do things like that. Yeah. Okay. So now we finish the question. Since the 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 kinds of music here are four in number, according to him, it is already clear how poetry ought to be ranked below music. Here. Meaning as part of it, right? Uh either right. the inspired kind or that is not. And from that kind, it is to be extinguished, namely the kind that leads upward. Uh, so there's, I'm not sure, the first way of life had this, so the one that leads upward. And he distinguished this from poetry insofar as, as it is poetry is imitative, since what music I does not wish to, this music does not wish to live in an imitative manner, but instead to snatch itself from the imitations to the paradigms of the harmonies and rhythms down here. Right. So this is the the solution to, but wait a minute, if, if poetry can be inspired, why is it in the hierarchy of um, um, of lives much lower than, uh, than Musique? And then the answer is, well, two different kinds of poetry, right? That There's inspired poetry and there's not inspired poetry. And um, and furthermore, the 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 musique in the kinds of life is is abstract, right? It leads upward to the imperceptible harmonies, which is a thing that you get even even today, right? The idea that you know uh, music, especially like classical music, is an, is an abstract art form, and therefore it's not mimetic, right? It's not imitative, and uh, and I'm like. I've known people, so I knew a professor who read The Republic when he was like 19 and since then never read a novel. Um, but he really appreciates because he's against mimesis, he's against imitation. He thinks it's bad for you. But he he would listen to music because like classical music. Because, oh, that, that's not imitation. That's just something abstract. And um, earlier than that, I mean... Uh, um, Kierkegaard has an essay on Don Giovanni where he talks about how music is the most abstract of all the arts. Um, although, of course, there he's talking about a piece of opera, which is imitative as well. But um, in any case, um, yeah, this is like a thread that gets carried on. And I don't know to what degree Proclus specifically is is responsible for this thread in the history of, of aesthetics, because after all, he's drawing from something in Plato. But um, yeah, the um, this is like an argument that gets continued. Right? So, so sometimes people say that music is better than poetry, or better better than you know poetry and writing in general because it's abstract. Mm -hmm. So, but again, so um, just to I like this basic thing was. Is the poet music? And the answer is yes. And what's with the music being higher or different than poetry? That's talking about a different poetry, one which is not inspired. Yeah, it's talking about a different music and a different poetry. Right, because the inspired not... poetry is 
is inspired by the muses. So if you have inspired music, it's, it's also it's automatically poetry. Um, but when you consider non-inspired music and non-inspired poetry, then you can have, you know, a difference here between music and and uh, and poetry. In that case, you can say that music is better than poetry. I mean, I wonder to what degree the. So I mean, like, what is the non-inspired uh, poet? It's probably like a tragedian, right? So, uh, pretty sure Prokes didn't think that the uh, tragic authors and the comedians were inspired. He takes a very dim view of tragedy and comedy, as we saw. Um, so they're probably not inspired. He doesn't take, and I don't remember seeing him quote them as like authorities, and you know they weren't taken as authorities the way that Homer was. Um, they became very important for teaching Greek, right? But um, so they were just as classics of the language. Um, and so he would say. And he would say precisely this, right? That this is imitative, that it improves the passions. Like when he was discussing tragedy and comedy, we saw no possibility of taking that and ascending upwards with it, right? He didn't even present that as something, oh, people can find it beautiful and this leads to beauty itself. No, it's um, it's just, an, and in that sense, it would be definitely inferior to merely someone who plays the liar well, because the liar music could still take you up. Um, to appreciate the mathematical harmonies, and then that's a stepping mm -hmm. point upwards. And right, because the comedies um, don't have enough unity. Yeah, so, um, exactly, yeah. Um, the it's a it's a question then, right, about what? Because well, this is actually something that comes across in Plato's aesthetics. Like when people go to study aesthetics in Plato. There is a problem that when he talks about beauty, he's usually talking about beautiful boys uh, or beautiful people, beautiful souls as well. But when and those aren't the passages where he's talking about poetry and talking about art. Right. So for us, it's really natural aesthetics deals with, you know, with the arts and with beauty, because like beauty is what the arts try to do. But those discussions aren't in, aren't one discussion yet in Plato. And. And they don't seem to be entirely the same discussion here in Proclus yet as either, right? When he was talking about tragedy and comedy, he didn't say they were ugly and he didn't say they were beautiful. It was just entirely different considerations. And he doesn't seem to have, like, we can watch a movie and say, wow, that was like a really beautiful moment. And um or or a play or something and it doesn't seem to be central to his considerations here i mean i'm trying to think occasionally when he's discussing plato like the commentaries and the commentaries like the commentary of the republic when he's commentary commenting on plato's words he says things like oh plato wrote this really well he chose the right words he put them in the right order and he put the right words in the right character's mouth and these things. Um, but I don't, I'm not quite sure if he ever comes to the point of saying, wow, this is a beautiful passage or something like that. Um, so, so that's like also um, just something we have to adjust a bit to, which is not only is there this weird concept of musique, right, which is like, culture, but also music occasionally. And there's also this disconnect that the idea of beauty and the idea of art aren't intertwined yet the way they are for us. I don't really know the story about how those two things come to join together. I don't know if it's a modern thing or what. So they're not the same thing, you think? Or... Like, uh... 
did your professor read watch any movies or that as bad as now? No, this professor, I think he didn't. He didn't. He he didn't watch any movies. Um <laughs> I think he he said that he was starting to just because now he had a daughter. And so he had uh -huh. to like, like read with her and he had to watch things with her. But uh, for himself, he didn't do that. <laughs> so it's funny when he when he's actually in an educational role of an infant, then he does it. Mm. But <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so uh, the inspired, uh, is it like, well, is inspiration here a kind of like um, I don't know how to say. Like we could say there's sacred or something like that uh, art and there's like secular art and I'm not sure if there's only there... a difference of like do people take it in a certain way or is it like a, what it's made in a different way so there is I mean there are both genres right and there, there are poets that are considered authorities about the gods like Homer and Hesiod and the Orphic texts that that we that we no longer have, um, and and then there's things that are considered as it were secular, even if they're about the gods as well, like tragedies, or also there were there were novels in antiquity, right? Um, um, so prose stories about imagined characters, and. And so there's there's both certainly both. What distinguishes inspiration, however, is also, you know, descriptions that the person doesn't know what they're doing in some sense, or they are in some sense. So in the in the IO, there's the um uh, the magnetic theory of inspiration, right? Which compares the poet, the rhapsode, to being drawn by the god the way that ma metal is drawn by a magnet, right? And then it becomes magnetic, and it and it then can draw other people, its hearers, into the same thing. And part of the point of the discussion there is that this uh, the rhapsode, the singer of who sings Homer, he he knows lots of Homer, right? But he doesn't really know what it means or what's good about life and so on. So there's there's something about that the activity of the inspired person doesn't um, is something that they don't know what they're doing, hmm. and I think that that's part of the and and so it's kind of like a dream, right? In the sense that you do it, but you don't know how to do it, as opposed to a merely technical poetry where you where you're following rules so you know what you're doing. Right? And and you get the same distinction in divination, right? So there's inspired divination, which is like when something comes to you in a dream or you go to the oracle and they just say things. Um, and and then there's technical divination, which is follows rules like astrology, right? And um, or augury, you know, also evaluating uh, entrails followed a bunch of rules, right? Like, there's no liver. What does that mean? So, mm -hmm. um, and and so this uh, this distinction between technical and and inspired goes uh, has to do also with this idea of of self control, right? Which is also why you know these people are co considered mad, right? They're not uncontrolled themselves. Um, the so, yeah, automatic. I mean, this is the, there are authors in the early 20th century, like E. R. Dodds, who was also very interested in paranormal phenomena. He he tried to compare this like with automatic writing, and other things popular in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, and the 19th, and seances and all that. Um, it's uh, it's interesting stuff, but it's it's not always very charitable to Neoplatonists and other people. Um, because they think it's the same thing, or because but, you know, the paranormal people are more serious than Dodds thinks. <laughs> think both. 
Um, I think it's not very charitable because sometimes uh, Dodds is says, oh, you know, these you say like oh these theurgic phenomena, these are phenomena of apparitions and so on. They're just like the charlatans that we have nowadays. And uh, but um, yeah, and then that's a problem both because he seems to have very little patience with contemporary people and also because he's um, seems then to project that into the Neoplatonists. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. He was like, well, despite having this kind of attitude, he thinks like these are all irrational things and so on. And he's right. There's also like, he's kind of responsible also for saying, you know, there's the rational part of the Neoplatonists, and that's like really interesting, the philosophy and stuff about soul and news and the one. But then there's like this dark side. It doesn't see that as integrated as part of the system. Um, and but uh, opposed to other people, he was like really interested in paranormal phenomena. He went to seances to figure it out and so on and things like that. Mm. Um, at the end of his life. Apparently, um, a scholar went to present a translation to him, and then he says, oh, thanks, but to, to nowadays I'm only interested in paranormal phenomena. And, um, so it was something that was quite interesting to him. Uh, is the, uh, um, what I, I mean, ask, like when the Neoplatonists, do, do they practice inspired writing, or is it always like this set of texts that are considered inspired? We have these hymns by Proclus. Are they considered inspired writing? I don't know. Uh, maybe. Maybe Proclus's hymns count. Um, and uh, Porphyry has this thing. I don't think it counts. I don't... I think you'd have to study it. But Porphyry does say something interesting about Plotinus, which is that he never revised anything he wrote. And he just wrote everything immediately as it came to him. But on the other hand, these are supposed to be based on classes that he was teaching. So there were like... Yeah. I know people that huh. don't revise things. They're just bad writing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it, but it wasn't... Um, the, the way that Porphyry presented... Isn't there, isn't there the thing over there that it was bad. like... I thought that the point was that it was like that he didn't consider writing uh, exalted enough to take seriously or something like that. Like he didn't care about spelling, something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's part of it. But I think the part of it is also something like that he lost. And, um, right, I think he's like, wow, he, he wrote these, these complex um, philosophical treatises in one go. Something like that. Mm -hmm. um and and sure and you know and there are passages of Plotinus where you say wow this guy is you know pretty excited um the so I don't know if but in general yeah in general I mean the the texts that they quote as inspired are all ancient right or mm -hmm. ancient with regard to them i mean the the chaldean oracles are quite recent and they might have come out i mean they might have been published uh around plotinus's lifetime maybe a little earlier so and so they all seem to be not by their own hand um like the inspired, there is, you know, Marinus's biography of Proclus does tell him about doing theurgy, right? So he does, you know, cause rain and heal people and these things. Um, but not exactly poetry. Mm, not that I can recall. Yeah. Unless you want to count the, the hymns. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, um, okay, so, I mean, now we only have five minutes, so it's a bit 
two yeah. middle to start question six. 